Praise the Lord forevermore. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. This is Brother Osi King, the privileged servant of Papa Joshua Aguila. I'd like to welcome you to this short broadcast. And we trust you will be blessed. I know you will be. I know you'll be blessed. So let's invite our friends. And it's more or less like a morning devotion. For some of you, you may have already finished your morning devotion. So uh, let's, let's share some thoughts. Praise God forevermore. So let's give you a few minutes and, and invite our friends. Let them join us in this devotion this morning. Praise God. Praise God forevermore. Hallelujah. Sister Joanne. God bless you all. Let's invite our friends. Amen. Praise God. Amen and amen. It's, it's really an honor to have many of you join us today. Oh. Praise God. Praise God forevermore. Amen and amen. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen and amen. So let's. Let's invite our friends. Amen. Amen and amen. So we'll still give you like one minute. Let's just... We have an interesting topic we want to introduce to you today. And... It's, it's very, very important that... Um, we understand... God bless you, Minister Esther. God bless you, ma. God bless you, Minister Esther. God bless you, ma. God bless you. God bless you. Thank you for making our time to join us. So let's invite our friends. Amen and amen. Praise God. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, the power, the praise the maker of the heavens and the earth and the seas. Lord, unto you are we gathered, reveal secrets to us. May our hearts indict a good matter and take all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. This is Brother Osi King, the privileged servant of Papa Joshua Egila. And it's a delight to be on your way. So I'm excited to be on your way today. Praise God. Now, if you look at our topic, um, Thank you, Mr. Nag, for joining us from India. Thank you. You're welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us from India. Now, I, I just want us to um, begin to look at this discourse because it's, it's, it's very important that we consider this discourse. And um, please let me know if you can really hear me clearly. Now, it's 
It's amazing that many Christians don't really know um, certain divine truths. And we can understand that, of course, the Bible is it's a, it's a compendium and it's a voluminous book that you can't really say you, you know it all. It is true. And the Bible itself is a spiritual book. And that is the more reason why it is very, very, very important you understand what the scriptures are communicating. It's very, very important you understand the truths of scriptures. If you look at the title of our discourse, we titled it Christian Politics and Russia. And it's very, very important. Thank you for joining us from Zambia. Now, it's very, very important that you understand what we're trying to introduce or begin to discuss. Because today, in many Bible seminaries, many Bible seminaries, many Christian colleges, there's usually a particular module called eschatology. And when you are looking at the study of ex when you when you're looking at the study actually in the structure of eschatology, there are various and of course universal postulations uh, that are that are being communicated on that study. For instance, if you look at um, different positions on the mark of the beast, for instance, you'll be amazed that even Christians, Christian ministers, Bible expositors, um, scriptural scholars, still don't agree on the different positions on the beast, the antichrist, the dragon, the serpent, the mark of the beast, the sign of the beast, and then the time those events will take place. And it's, it's sad that, that even within the church world, there's still no universal agreement on these positions. And of course we can understand because there are different aspects of various uh, beliefs when it comes to the different shades of um, denominational positions. We can understand. And that is why that responsibility lies solely in the hands of the visioneers of different ministries. But by and large, here, you are looking at a complex position. When it even comes to the beast, the Antichrist, the signs to the end time, there are still different positions on the subject. Now, um, for ages now, for many years now, there, are, there have been arguments on the time lag, the time, the calendar for the emergence of the Antichrist and all those things. Well, John said he's already uh, in the world. But our focus is not on that today. As a matter of fact, there have been different positions on even the four horses mentioned in Revelation chapter 6. From verses 1 to 9, Revelation chapter 6 from verses 1 to 9, there have been different postulations on the, on the four horses, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, and the pale horse. And different church circles have, have referred to the white horse to be the Roman Catholic church, the red horse to be China, 
because China uses a red flag, a red colored flag. Meanwhile, the US also has uh, some aspects of red on the flag. And then the black horse, uh, some Bible expositors have said is, in, is Islam. And then the pale horse, they say, it's during the period of the Antichrist, the end time. Now, if you will ask me, I completely disagree with those positions. The White House is not the Roman Catholic Church at all. Because if you read in context what John was trying to communicate, you will know that the White House is not the Catholic Church. And this is where certain Christian beliefs have suggested that the Pope, the Pope is an Antichrist. Now, some have even said Pope Francis is the Antichrist. What they don't know is that Pope Francis is born again. So he's not just a Roman Catholic priest. He is born again. He speaks in tongues. He has received the Holy Spirit, so he speaks in tongues. So if those of us who speak in tongues now call someone of our own belief who speaks in tongues, who believes in the resurrection of Jesus, an antichrist. Then what does that make the rest of us? But some have insisted that um, it's going to be Pope Francis to be the antichrist. And it's just funny. And then they said the red horse is China. China is mean, vicious, killing people. Now, name any country in the world that does not kill people. But anyway, those things, we can understand why some of them uh, bringing up those positions. Sometimes some of them speak those things um, in a way to celebrate their countries, the countries, the countries they represent, and then ignore and see a rival nation, particularly a superpower, as an agent of darkness. And many of them come from the standpoint of um, economic systems. There are many Christian preachers who rely on economic systems. So, for instance, the United States is a capitalist system. China is a communist system. Russia is a communist system. So, here, they can say the communist system is of the devil, is satanic. But when you look at the structure of Christianity, you discover that God is not a democrat. God is not even democratic in nature. God is autocratic which is what some of those communist countries represent, actually. There was a message we taught many years ago titled The Communist God. And of course, it stirred up a lot of provocation, but it was just the truth. God, God is autocratic. God is sovereign. He's supreme. We preachers say these things, and it is true. God is not a democratic God. Some of say, but God, even though he's autocratic, he believes in democracy. Mm-mm. If that is the case, why did they make King David a king? Why did they make his son to continue after him? No. Kings always handed over to their sons. If God really believed in democracy, you will know King David and his sons will not rule. Okay. Now, we just said all that we said to let you know that there are different positions. And that even in the study of eschatology, and the different arms of it, there is still no unifying um, positions on the studies of it. And quite frankly, uh, given the kind of person that I am, I decided to do a deep study on all the various positions postulated on the different subjects within the confines of eschatology. And I discovered that it was just a shame. It's just a shame that even ministers can agree on the same subject. But now, I, I want us to look closely and begin to introduce to you this subject. I, I see myself as probably having a school, having a school that I would like to call Christian politics. Or maybe I look forward to maybe Re receiving an invitation as a visiting professor to come and teach on Christian politics. I really want to teach Christian politics because it's one aspect a lot of Christians ignore. And those who 
don't really know um, the true position on Christian politics and yet seem to suggest that they know those things, take advantage of the ignorant. A classical example now is, is um, Russia. And um, when you look at the country Russia today, Um, there have been different positions on, on what Russia is in scriptures or what many preachers have suggested Russia is in scripture. But you see, it's just unfortunate that many believe some of these positions, hook, line, and sinker, without actually taking the time to look at the truth of it. For instance, I'd like you to kindly go to Ezekiel chapter 38. Let's introduce you to something. Now, in Ezekiel chapter 38, and please, um, I'd like you to just give keen interest to this. And if you have any question, you can text it. And I trust that in between, I'll be able to answer your question. And I think that Christian politics is something we need to start looking at, discussing in our churches. Because we have a lot of fools in church. And this is the reason why even a lot of Christians today are not interested in politics in their various countries. And if politics is not important in Christianity, then why is God telling us the story of King David? Why is God telling us the story of Moses delivering the children of Israel from, from Egypt? All these things were all politics. They were all politics. And today Israel is still standing. Have you ever thought about why King Solomon had to marry 300 wives and 700 girlfriends? It was Christian politics because now, when you look at the context of Christian politics now, you are looking at a position where, um, for bilateral purpose, in order to evade war, in order to, to stop war from rival nations, King Solomon had to marry the daughters of the kings. And those things were political in nature because his father, King David, fought was all his life. But when King Solomon came on the throne, he had to marry the daughters of the enemy kings. And the first woman he married was the daughter of the king of Egypt. And these things were all pol politics. And it's amazing. Somebody today may begin to look at King Solomon and say, oh, King Solomon was very adulterous. He married 300 women. Mm -mm, that was not the case. He had to do it for the sake of peace. Because Israel has always been a nation that was under target for years. So it's just the truth. It's just the simple truth. Now, today we preachers go to the extreme to say King Solomon was very adulterous. And if you look at even when God sent the prophet Ahijah, the prophet Ahijah to, to prophesy against King Solomon that he was going to divide his kingdom. God said King Solomon will rule forever and that God now said to King Solomon he would divide the nation after King Solomon died. But King Solomon is even doing something God is angry with. But God knew it was all politics. And God had to wait for King Solomon to die and then King Solomon's son, Rehoboam, had to suffer for his father's errors. But there are extreme politics, no doubt. But you need to understand that Christian politics is very, very important. When you look at Islam today, Islam, when you look at the structure of Islam today, in, a, in as much as you want to interpret the extremities of Islam, the truth of the matter is that however your sentiments may swing, if you want to swing your sentiments, 
to the right or to the left when it concerns Islam. One thing that you can never be taken away from the Muslims is that politics, the political structure of Islamic belief has made that belief today a renowned force in the world. Now, whether the, some of them say they are Sunnis, they are this, they are uh, whatever, the different sects, it doesn't matter. And all those things too are still political too, because they all celebrate Ramadan together. They all believe in Muhammad as the main prophet. And, but if you look at how they drive their forces, how they drive their beliefs, they go from the political side. For instance, you can't say Saudi Arabia, no matter how good Saudi Arabia is to America, Saudi Arabia is still not a Christian nation. Yet, when you look at the U.S. Federal Reserve today, Saudi Arabia contributes $700 billion to the U.S. economy, to the U.S. Federal Reserve. Saudi Arabia, that's Islamic money. So, Today, you, the United States of America says Saudi Arabia is her friend. We are allies. We all produce oil together. But Saudi Arabia is an Islamic nation. And no matter how America tries to attack the extreme, or the extremists, the radicals in Islam, America does not point her radar to Saudi Arabia. They don't. But America is a Christian nation. Saudi Arabia is an Islamic nation. So if it is possible for a Christian nation and an Islamic nation to work together politically to advance each other's interests, then why do you think Iran is the problem? What makes you think that Saudi Arabia is not the one instigating Iran, yet giving money to America to attack. That's why I said, in the process of time, we need to begin to look at these things critically on the radicality of Christian politics. Because Christian politics too, Christians, a lot of Christians today have become very, very extreme in their various beliefs. In America today, a Christian can walk into a, a mosque and attack fellow Muslims, which is actually not right and think that they are the ones causing problems in the world. So we need to bring a balance to this. So let's start with Russia first. Let, let's start with Russia. Russia lately has been making the news. Russia has always made news, no doubt. But it looks like they are becoming more in the news today. Now, I, I want to make you see where some Bible scholars bring in the position of Russia as one of the enemy nations, not just only to, to the world. Okay, let me put it this way. If the United States of America is trying to protect her interests, or let's just say, if the United States of America is trying to protect an ally, Ukraine, against the invasion of Russia, one of the questions you need to ask yourself, is that an absolute truth? that the United States of America is trying to protect her ally, Ukraine, against Russia. Now, if you, of course, what Russia is doing right now is wrong, really. Russia is actually violating the sovereignty of the nation of Ukraine. And America can come on that grounds and say, we are defending a sovereign nation, which is actually what is in the air, in the media today. And that is not wrong. So what America is doing for Ukraine is not wrong at all. It is very, very correct. They need to protect an allied nation. But is it that America is doing it to protect her own self? Knowing that if Russia takes over Ukraine, that will make Russia become more powerful. <clears throat> and that can make Russia a serious global threat to America. Because the, democrat the, the European democratic countries today, if you look at how they are positioned, 
if Ukraine is threatened, because it is like um, Ukraine right now is like the lead, the lead. You know when you have a container, when when you have a container with a lead on it, <clears throat> for instance, let's say um, this is this is Ukraine. Sorry, this is Russia. This whole bottle is Russia, and then let's just say this top, this lead here. This is just Ukraine. This is Ukraine. And Russia is invading now. Could it be that NATO, the United Nations, they are backing up Ukraine just to put a lead on Russia's aggression, to lock it up, knowing that if that lead is taken away, the, the aggression of Russia, and what is the aggression of Russia? You need to understand that what America is trying to protect and the Western nations against NATO, against, sorry, Russia through Ukraine, is the ideology of Russia, communism. America does not want that to invade Europe because if it invades Europe, it will certainly creep into America. Now, in America, there's already an issue with uh, white supremacy. And quite frankly, when you look at the ideology of white supremacy, it is strictly communist belief because Hitler was a communist. And today, when you look at the various sects within the white supremacy circle, you begin to see that what they strongly believe in is the ideologies of Hitler. That's why they, they carry the Nazi signs. The white supremacists, they have the Nazi signs. They wear Nazi tattoos. They even dress that way like ancient Germany. Because Hitler is from Germany. Although there have been arguments whether he's kind of Polish, is a Polish German and all that. Because if you look at Poland and Germany, they share the same border. And from Poland, you can see Russia. So here's the point. The point is that what are uh, the Western democratic nations of the world trying to use Ukraine for? Of course, you can see now, it's very, very good what they are trying to do, to put a lead on Russia's aggression. Now, you need to understand, what you see at the Russian border today, or at the Ukrainian border, with 100,000 troops, over 100,000 troops, all those military arsenals, that's not the aggression, really. The aggression is the ideology of Russia, the communist ideology. America does not want the communist ideology to have uh, preeminence and then become supreme because already America has an issue with China. China has the largest population in the world. China is the most populous, populous nation in the world and it is not democratic. It is communist. Family politics run China. China has more people. In population, China is greater than the United States of America and other European nations put together. They are already a communist nation. They've been able to protect that interest for years, for years, for decades. They will not allow, um, they, will they will not allow an iota of democracy to come into China. Now, here's the point. Do you know that there is no Facebook in China? There is nobody in China who has a Facebook page. China forbids it. There is no Google in China. China does not allow Google. If you are found, if your computer is found on Google, you'll be picked up by the Chinese government because they see those things as infiltration of democracy. And then they see them as instruments for agitations revolutionary agitations. So you, you find out that China does not want anything Facebook, anything Google. They don't want any Western influence. So even though they have good relationship in the area of business, China and the United States, China does not find it friendly at all. So don't bring in democracy. Don't even suggest it. Don't make it a conversation. Okay. Now, Russia has a problem with that because Russia now, in the past, has allowed 
democracy. In other words, through the fall of the Berlin Wall by Gorbachev, a one-time Russian president, Russia, for the first time, in a sense, tasted the forbidden apple of democracy. And having tasted the forbidden apple of democracy now, Russia likes it, but there are still some um, Russian leaders with communist belief who share the same ideology with China. And one of such a person is Putin. Now, he has been able to come into the corridor of power now. <clears throat> and now he wants to see how he can build back that wall against the Western world. But already agitations are already going on within Russia because there are some Russians who like democracy. And so China sees that as a weakness that Russia has. You have already tasted the forbidden apple of democracy. We, the Chinese government, have never tasted it. But Russia has. And so you see now, even though Putin is trying to governize his forces, the thing here is not the military asinas that Russia has. America has more, better. But why, why is America not even using it? Because America knows that the military aggression is nothing compared to the mental, ideological, communist aggression. by communist states, like Russia. Okay. And this is the reason why Putin now is agitating that democracy should be done away with. And that is why he locked up Nessie, Nev uh, Alexei, Navalny, and many others. There were a lot of assassinations that took place in Russia. Now, the reason why we're bringing up these positions is because there is a tendency to see Russia as an enemy nation. There's a tendency to see Russia as an enemy nation. One of the things that made America a world power was when the Russian war fell. The, uh, what's the name again? It, it used to have one abbreviation. Um, Czech, Czechoslovakia, Poland, Slovenia. N N double C R or something, USSR. Sorry, the USSR. So when that war was crumbled, it gave America an ascending power to be a world power. And so Putin is trying to build that back. So, but like we said, the military arsenals is not the thing. What um, Western leaders understand fully well is the ideology of the communist system. And one of the things the Western world have been able to drive successfully is that they see the communist ideology as a complete violation of the fundamental human rights given the International Charter. But here's the point. Even in the Western world, fundamental human rights too have been violated and have been violated almost every day. Why? Why do you have more police force? even in democratic nations, because of, to mitigate against the violation of fundamental rights of citizens. So even though America is trying to suggest it outside, it has issues with it, with homeland. So, and not only America, the UK and many others. Now, here's the point. When you look at the Christian circle, when you look at Christianity, the position they have on Russia is not a good one. Now, the reason why we're telling you this is because there are Christians everywhere, all around the world, including China, although the Chinese government must not know that you are a Christian. Otherwise, that's death. But here's the point. 
There are Christians everywhere. And there is an ideology driven by Christians, by Christian theological leaders that Russia and China are the two enemy nations that the Antichrist will use against Israel. And so given that position now, Russia is an enemy nation, China is an enemy nation. But when you look at the hub today, the hub of Christianity today, uncontested, the hub of Christianity today is here in the United States, is the United States of America. And so, um, like what Karl Marx says, religion is the opium of the masses. You find out that through Christianity now, there had been a propagation on the grounds of eschatology that China and Russia and other communist nations are enemies to Israel. And because they are enemies to Israel, they are enemies of God. And that they are the ones Jesus is coming to destroy. And when you ask them, why do you bring up such positions? And from where? They will take you to Ezekiel 38. Now, let's show you something in Ezekiel 38. It says, And the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, This is Ezekiel 38, verses 1. Verse 2 now. Son of man, set thyself against Gog, the land of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach, and Tubar, and prophesy against him. Now, this... And then say, Thus saith the Lord God, Behold, I am against you, O Gog, the chief prince of Meshach and Tuban. And I will turn thee back and put hooks into thy jaws. Okay. Now, when you now go to verses 13, you will see, he says, Sheba and Dedan, and the merchants of Tarsus, with all the young lions therefore, thereof, shall say unto thee, Art thou come to take a spoil? Hast thou gathered thy company to take a prey, to carry away silver and gold, to take away cattle and, gold, and goods, to take a great spoil? So here, you are looking at Sheba and Dedan being allies to Gog and Magog. Now, when you see the word Gog and Magog, it is suggested that Magog is Russia. And then Didan, Sheba and Didan are allied nations to Russia. An allied nation to Russia, for instance, today is China, is Iran. And so you can see now how even ministers of the gospel, particularly Bible um, theologians in Bible seminaries, in many Bible colleges, have suggested that China, that, that Russia, China, and their communist allies will be enemies to Israel and attack Israel, but that only the United States and some of the Western nations, like the United Kingdom, are good friends to Israel. First of all, you need to understand that's not true. But what we just told you in a nutshell is what has been propagated. So you find out that when you now look at Western aggression, when you look at um, the Western resistance against Russia's aggression towards Ukraine, against China's aggression towards Taiwan, you, you begin to think that um, um, they are doing it on the grounds of trying to protect the sovereignty of Ukraine, which is actually true in a sense, and then the sovereignty of Taiwan, which is actually true in a sense. But the truth of the matter is that that political support to either Ukraine and Taiwan have been mixed with Christian ideologies. The Christian ideology that Magog 
Gog and Magog is the enemy here with Sheba and Dedan. And so today, um, Bible scholars will tell you that the ancient name for Russia was Magog. Now, it's not true. It's just not true. Exactly. Politics mixed with ideology. Christian ideology now. So here, you are looking at setting, setting wrong Christian beliefs that has infiltrated the political spectrum. <laughs> pastor Victor, I love you, sir. Even if you disagree, I love you, sir. You know now, you know you're my pastor. I love you, sir. I don't, dis I don't argue with you, sir. Now, now, here's the point. First of all, before we drive the ideology to go with that position that Russia is Magog or Gog and Magog, First of all, where did this thing come from? So, let's, let's even find out where Magog was first mentioned. Because <clears throat> um, if you ask many Christian leaders today who believe that Russia is Gog and Magog, and you ask them, where did you get this position from? Um. <laughs> oh, okay, you agree with me. Okay, my oh, I'm so sorry. I love you, Pastor Victor. Thank you for agreeing with me. Okay, thank you, sir. <laughs> I love you, sir. I, you know, you know, you're my pastor. I can't disagree with you. You know, I love you, sir. Thank you, Pastor Victor. Oh, <laughs> thank you for agreeing with me too. But here's the point, you know, because um, over the years, over the years, in many um. Um, many Christian Bible colleges and, and many um, Christian circles, many Bible seminaries, these things have been driven into our minds when they are raising up young ministers. And so they say, Russia is an enemy. And so they bring it under the auspices of eschatology. Now, the question is this. If Russia is truly the enemy of Israel, and other communist nations are enemies of Israel. Why are you bringing it on the grounds of eschatology, which many people are really not interested in? Why don't you make it a common popular teaching, like salvation? Isn't it amazing that the way the Christian circle today have structured their teachings, they have structured it that salvation is the ultimate, it should be the most common, so we teach salvation. Why is salvation not brought under eschatology? Or do you think that salvation has no aspect with eschatology? If salvation has no aspect with eschatology, why do you have the two witnesses in Revelation chapter 11 who will still go and preach? They hardly teach that. So, salvation today, the way it is preached, accepting the lordship of the name of Jesus, having believed that God raised him from the dead, we don't seem to factor, we don't seem, they, they, they make it a common teaching, they don't factor it under eschatology. What is eschatology? Study of the end time. Is salvation not a study of the end time too? Salvation is part of the study of the end time. So why didn't you group it under eschatology? At the end of the day, you find the preacher. After teaching eschatology, any subject on eschatology, he will not say, I'd like you to give your heart to Christ. Why are you telling me to give my heart to Christ with what you've already said? Is salvation part of this subject under eschatology? You see, they, they keep quiet. Now, here's the point. When you hear a Bible seminary tell you that Gog and Magog is Russia, Sheba and Dedan are the allies of Russia, question, Pastor, where did you get that from? Because in many Christian colleges today, they teach these things. And the people don't even care to ask. And even those who taught it were taught that way. So there was no... There was no need to ask the question. 
You'll be amazed how many Christians today see Russia as an enemy nation. And Russia today is heavily Roman Catholic. Heavily Roman Catholic. Someone say that's why the Antichrist will come from there. Okay, how about China that is that does not entertain Christianity at all? <clears throat> so now, first of all, we're, we're introducing this topic to you. So that's why we said part one. Christian politics and Russia. And it, it's something like I said. I, I, I like to teach. I like to teach Christian politics. I want people to understand that we're not just fools, just studying the Bible. Christ died for us, we are saved, and then prepared to go to heaven. No. Because policies are being created every day. They're shaping our Christian work. And today we talk about one world government. Then what is the role of Christianity in it? Okay, so now here's the point. Was Ezekiel talking about Russia? Certainly not. Ezekiel was not referring to Russia here. Because if Ezekiel was talking about Russia, you'll be amazed where Magog was first mentioned. Now, I want to tell you something. First of all, there was no such thing called Gog in the first place. It never existed. It was the Bible translators who put it there. What was known from the very beginning was Magog and not Gog and Magog. And it was deliberately put there because the word go, Magog, Magog, when you understand the meaning of the word Magog, you will now know why Gog had no business being there. Because if you look at the spelling of Magog, M-A-G-O-G, if Magog is already, if Gog is already in the word Magog, why are you not mentioning Gog and Magog? You see, it was an error. So, and don't forget, the first translation of the Bible in English was the Tetint translation. So, let's find out where Magog was first mentioned first. First. And so, you need to go to now... Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10. Let's see where Magog was first mentioned. Like we said, Gog was never there. Now, in verses 1 of Genesis chapter 10, it says, Now, this is the genealogy of the sons of Noah, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. So, Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And sons were born to them after the flood. So after the flood, that's when their wives started having children. But before the flood, their wives, even though they were married, did not have children. It was after the flood they started giving birth. Now I want you to see something in verses 2. The sons of Jephthah. Jephthah was one of the sons of Noah. The sons of Jephthah were Goma, Magog, Madia, Java, Tuban, Meshach. You remember? Ezekiel 38 verses 2 to 3. Meshach and then Tyrus. But let's focus on Magog. Magog was there. There was no Gog. Magog. But when you now read Ezekiel, Ezekiel said Gog and Magog. Now, I will show you why that Gog and Magog was a mistake. Actually, the word Magog, which was the name of one of the sons of Jephthah, the grandson of Noah, is that the word Magog 
is a compound word, actually. It's the coming together of two words, Ma and Gog. Now, we'll show you why Gog and Magog is a mistake. Now, Magog, Ma, Ma, M-A, is actually the word man. M-A-N, man. So you can say the short form of man. In the Hebrew, M-A, ma, is the word individual. An individual. But this time around, a, mo a man, a male, not a female. Because it says the sons. So here, he's not mentioning the daughters. So here is referring to a male, ma, a man. And then gog, G-O-G, gog, means his lands. It means lands, L-A-N-D-S. So magog means an individual and his lands, a man and his lands. And gog, lands, is in plural, lands. So Magog means when Jephthah gave birth to his son, Magog, he says, you are a man with many lands. That's the meaning of the word Magog. So now, when you now go to Ezekiel 38 and say Gog and Magog, you already know what Gog means. Gog means what? Lands. So how can you say lands and a man and his lands? Does that make sense? Does it? That's why that word Gog was wrong. Now, is that word Magog, is it Russia? Nope. It's actually a man who was a Jew and his generations. So we'll close with that. Go to First Chronicles chapter 5. Because you need to know these things. Today, you see many preachers on TV, on Christian television, they talk about Gog, Magog, and all that. They bamboozle you. They think it's just simple. And then later on, they'll tell you they want you, they want to help your Christian growth. You should buy this resource for $72. It's a 14 series part. Whatever they are trying to tell you in 14 series that is wrong, I just corrected it. And if you are upset, I owe you no apology, actually. You came to my page. Someone said, but you invited me. I did, actually. <laughs> okay, now, go to First Chronicles chapter, chapter, chapter 5. Now, King James was the first person who translated the Bible into English. And he was the king of England, actually. And as at that time, the printing press just came out. But before he did, the Bible used to be read to him in German. And he did like the stories. The closest manuscript of the translation of the Bible from the Hebrew and the Greek was German. And so the Bible used to be narrated. And Martin Luther, the founder of the Protestant church, was the one, he used to be a Roman Catholic priest. He broke out from the Roman Catholic because he believed that people should have access to the written materials. So he took time to translate the Hebrew and the Greek because he could speak the both, he was a scholar of both languages. And so it was easy for him to translate it into German. And that's where the word God is, came from. The word G-O-D, God, is a German word. And the word God is not an English word. English language adopted it, just like the way you have depot, D-E-P-O-T. When you say home depot, I'm going to the depot, depot. is a French word adopt, adopted in, in English. Like the word fiancé. Fiancé is not an English word. It's a French word that was adopted into English. The same word, God, G-O-D, is a German word that was adopted into English. It was King James who did it. And to the Germans... G-O-D, God, means an object of worship. And you and I know God is not an object. But today we use the word God, God, God. All right. So the original Hebrews never used the word God. 
They use the word Yahweh. Okay, now, here's the point. When King James translated, when the stories of the Bible were being read to him in German language, and then the person reading it will now interpret it from German into English, he said he would like to sponsor the translation from the German manuscript. So the English Bible today that you see around the world, the old King James was translated not from the original Hebrew and the Greek. It was translated directly from the German text. And that is why that word God was captured into English, adopted into English. Do you understand? Okay. But why would King James do that? Like we said, even though King James was a king, an autocratic ruler, the Germans were already communist. He did not believe in their ideologies. And the stories on the Bible in German being read to him seemed to give Germans supremacy into the palace, into the palace. And so now to see that a whole exalted King James is being told the stories of the Bible in German language, that seemed to give supremacy to the German language. And don't forget, interestingly, and if you check, the British monarch today are immigrants from Germany. The Queen of England, her descendants, she comes from a generation, she's come, she comes from a German generation. Her great-grandfather is, Germ, is German. Their generation, the British monarch, they all hail from Germany. But they wanted to just carve a niche. And so when the British people began to react against even the family, they decided to change their name to Windsor and take up a British name. You still have titles like Duke of Edinburgh. Edinburgh. Those are German. They were, the word Edinburgh is it not a German word. All right. Okay, here's the point. Let's conclude with this. Um, King James felt that the German influence has crept into the palace through the Bible, through the Holy Scriptures from the Roman Catholic. And he didn't like the idea. He wanted a situation where English language would have supremacy and become the universal language. And it has really worked. It gave you and I today access to the Bible. I, I, I can't imagine, for instance, Pastor Christian reading the Bible, John 3.16 in German. German. But how would you have sounded? Or me reading the Bible to you in German. But in any case, now, the reason why we said that is because you could still see the elements of political sentiments. That's the point. Political sentiments. Even in the translations of the Bible from German into English. Political sentiments. So you see, these things have crept in. And now we Christians are not saying we are not interested in politics. You are wrong. Even the origin of the English Bible you read later translated to your Yoruba language, to your Igbo language, to your whatever, Hausa language, to your South African uh, language. I learned that there are 11 languages in South Africa, the Zulus, to, the, to your own various Bibles. Haitian Bible is all political. Now, here's the point. Let me, let's show you now where Magog comes from. First Chronicles chapter 5, I'll read quickly from verses 1. He said, Now the sons of Reuben, the sons of Reuben, Reuben, firstborn of Israel, he was indeed the firstborn. But because he defied his father's bed, if you read Genesis chapter 49, he, he had intercourse with his father's girlfriend. But because he defied his father's bed, his birthright was given to the sons of Joseph. Ephraim was given instead of Manasseh. The, sons of, the son of Israel, so that the genealogy is not listed according to the birthright. Yet Judah prevailed over his brothers, and from him came a ruler. Talking about King David. <clears throat> Although the birthright was still Joseph's. Okay. The sons of Reuben, the first of Israel, the firstborn of Israel, were Hanok, Palom, Hez, Sorry, Hezron, 
Kami, the sons of Jewel, were Shamia, his son. Gog, now you see the word Gog there, is actually Magog. Because Gog means land. You can't call somebody land. It's actually Magog. So, Shamia, his son, Magog, Shemiah's son. They are all descendants of Jewel. Shamia, his son, Makiah, his son, Ria, his son, Baal, his son, and Beria, his son, whom Tiglath, Pelisa, king of Assyria, carried into captivity. He was the leader. He was leader of the Rubenites. So you, you find out that the reason why we brought you here is to make you see that Magog was a Jew and not a Russian. Okay. We'll continue in our next class. So you see, even Christian politics here in the Western world twisted the whole ide ideology to make it look like Russia is the enemy, even to Christianity, because Russia is an enemy to Israel. Meanwhile, you will never see where Russia went to attack Israel. Not one day. Russia did not stand up one day to go and attack Israel. It was Germany who did. But today, the Western world is not really talking about that because Germany is a democratic country. They have, they have in a sense, purged themselves of communist ideologies. So today, it looks like it is Russia. But Germans were the ones who killed Jews. You will never see where Russia attacked Israel. And the reason why Russia couldn't attack Israel be, or be, is because of the Roman Catholic ideology. The Russians are heavily Roman Catholic. No Russian goes to war on Easter, on Lent. They are heavily Roman Catholic. Heavily Roman Catholic. They will not fight during a Roman Catholic ceremony. They will never go to war. They will never. You can even kill them. They are ready to die. You will never see a Russian go to war during Lent. They, they are heavily Roman Catholic. Now, here's the point. The Roman Catholic ideology believes that the Messiah is from Israel. The Roman Catholic believe that the Messiah, which is Jesus, whom they believe in, is from Israel. And like I said, Russians are heavily Roman Catholic. Now, if they are heavily Roman Catholic, which means that they answer to Rome, and Rome is telling them that the Messiah comes from Israel. Why would Russia go and attack Israel? So you see here how certain um, um, Western nations have you corrupted true theological teachings and um, 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 ideologies, extreme ideologies to see China Russia and their allies as enemy nations to Christianity. And if they are enemy nations to Christianity, they are enemy nations to Israel. And Israel is democratic, so they are enemies to democracy. So you see the mingling, the interwoven. I don't know whether you are getting this. Everything is so interwoven. And you think you don't need to know. Okay, today, why would America look at a country and pick someone and install the person as a ruler. America still does that. And they've been, they've been able to do that to help the people, the citizens of that country, really. They have. Which is a very, very good move. When the people are stupid, they can't even rule themselves. So, the bigger brother has to help. Russia does the same thing, too. Russia did that with Ukraine previously. So, you, you need to understand... Now, nah, please, please, don't take me out of context. I'm not supporting Russia in anything they are doing when it comes to violating the sovereign integrity of other nations. But what we're saying is that let's just understand uh, the Christian influence in the, in, in, in the political resistance against Russian aggression, which is actually wrong too. Russians, their aggression is wrong because they want to propagate their communist ideology to make one person the sole ruler. That's all we're just trying to make you understand. All right, so this is how much we'll take today. I hope you were blessed. And if I offended, you don't get upset. I'm not a Russian stooge. I'm not that at all. As you can see, I'm just 
showing you something from the Bible. Now, in our next discourse on this subject, Christian politics in Russia, we're going to look at the, the superstitions, the, uh, the previous ideological or mythical belief, cosmological beliefs in the 17th century concerning Magog, because that's where it became very popular. And from there, uh, because you, you begin to ask, how did this thing, first of all, creep into interpreting Magog, Gog and Magog to be Russia? Where did it all begin? In our next class, we'll discuss that. God bless you. I love you all. And please, be interested in Christian politics. And I think we should be discussing this. This will inform you, and even if you are going into politics, you'll be able to know why you believe what you say you believe. There are many politicians today with, with no ideologies at all. And if you are going to support a politician, it should be a politician whose ideology advances the kingdom of heaven. And to see that the will of God is done on earth here as it is in heaven. We love you all. Thank you. Have a great day. Bye-bye.